Hey guys, it's Will, and today we're going to be flying over Kansas, state number 16 on our tour of all 50 U.S. states in Microsoft Flight Simulator. Kansas is home to 2.913 million people, making it the 34th most populated state in the country. It is 82,278 square miles, making it the 15th largest state in the country. And it was granted statehood in 1861, making it the 34th state to join the Union. We're currently flying over Wichita, Kansas, which is the largest city um, fully in Kansas. More on that in a second, but first let's go over the history of Kansas in general. Native Americans inhabited the area for millennia. Uh, Wikipedia doesn't seem to agree on when exactly Native Americans were first in the area. Uh, and perhaps it's unknown. Uh, certainly unknown to Wikipedia. Um, the Spanish explorers were first Europeans to set foot in the area in 1541. In 1803, the United States gained control of Kansas through the Louisiana Purchase, through most of Kansas, I should mention. Uh, portions of southwest Kansas weren't acquired until the Spanish-American War of 1848. Um, the Kansas-Nebraska Act uh, split the territory into Kansas and Nebraska. Uh, and we'll talk a uh, we'll talk a little bit more about bleeding Kansas later, uh, but basically the Sparkness version is uh, northern or the politicians in the government decided or couldn't decide on whether to make Nebraska and Kansas a free state or a slave state, so they decided to split the territory into two and let the voters in each state decide for themselves, uh, which kind of sounds reasonable on the surface, uh, but had some certainly some nasty side effects, uh, like a bunch of voters, or a bunch of settlers from Missouri and Arkansas, which were slave states at the time, uh, rushing over into Kansas to try, try to sway the electorate to make it a slave state, uh, and at the same time, a bunch of settlers from Massachusetts and the rest of New England coming in to try to make Kansas a free state, uh, and tensions between those two groups uh, led to conflict, and that ultimately was the bleeding Kansas era. Um, after the Civil War, Kansas was a, uh, a melting pot of homesteaders, African-American settlers, and cowboys. Wichita itself is home to 390,000 people. The metropolitan area is 645,000 people strong. Uh, there's first evidence of habitation in Wichita um, by Native Americans around 3,000 years ago. Um, the Spanish... Uh, when they first discovered Kansas in 1541, they passed through the Wichita area. Um, a trading post was built here in 1863, and the town was platted in 1870. It became a destination for cattle drives from Texas, uh, and... Uh, oh, I lost my place in my notes. Uh, yeah, sorry. And then... Oh, ignore that. There's our video, <laughs> every video recurrence of that message popping up. Uh, in 1872, the railroad reached Topeka, meaning that cattle that were being driven up to, or sorry, not Topeka, um, Wichita, uh, the, the uh, railroad reached here, allowing the uh, cattle to be exported, uh, which further increased the cattle uh, drive um, economy. Uh, in fact, they're exporting so much cattle that uh, for a while Wichita was known as Cowtown. Uh, but, you know, Kansas City it was also known as Cowtown for a period, uh, so it wasn't an exclusive title or anything. A speculative land boom in the area in the 1880s caused rapid growth, followed by an economic recession when the real estate bubble burst. Um, deposits of natural gas were found nearby in 1914, which triggered another economic boon. Money from natural gas and oil fields allowed entrepreneurs to invest in the air airplane industry. Uh, and Cessna was founded here uh, in the 1910s, as well as Beechcraft. Um, those are two plane companies, obviously. It was known as the air capital of the world as early as 1929. Um, and in 1934, Boeing became the city's largest employer. Um, the economy boomed during World War II uh, because Boeing was in charge of making the B-29 bombers, and most of those were made right here in Wichita. Uh, later on, the Learjet Corporation was also founded in Wichita. Um, uh, in addition, fa the fast food chains Pizza Hut and White Castle uh, 
were born here. Uh, throughout its entire history, um, even t through today, the city has grown steadily. Um, Boeing, at this point, has left the city, uh, but Spear Aerosystems and Airbus still have facilities in Wichita. And uh, today, the largest uh, sectors of the economy are manufacturing, mainly aircraft manufacturing, healthcare, and oil. So fly once again over downtown. The tallest building is the Epic Center, which stands at 385 feet. That's pretty epic. I believe that might be it right there, though I'm not sure. I did, don't recall actually seeing a picture of it in my notes. Oh, well, we're maybe going to crash. I'm going way too slow. Whoa, that was sketchy. We saved it, though. <laughs> okay. It's always tough. I try to fly slow over downtown, but slow and low doesn't always work too well for a second plane. Um, I was about to comment that uh, I'm not sure what these stadiums are, but they, it does look like they have two separate stadiums near each other. They don't have any Major League Sports teams. So, but they could be uh, concert venues or whatnot, or minor league uh, sports. Let me hop on uh, Google Maps real quick. Let's see if I can uh, figure out what's going on there. Um... Wichita State University is, uh, you guessed it, in Wichita. It is the third largest university in Kansas. Um, uh, do do. Where is Wichita? There it is. Kind of tough to tell from the, uh, from a non-satellite image. So let me pull up the satellite image. So the uh, the bluer lo looking circular dome is Music Theater Wichita. So that, that would appear to be a concert venue. And the other building is the Intrust Bank Arena. Uh, which, uh, which is home to the Wichita Thunder of this ECHL and the Wichita Force of the CIF. It is the second largest indoor arena in Kansas. Um, notable people uh, from Wichita, uh, not counting all the founders of the various uh, airplane or Pizza Hut or White Castle um, companies that were found here, uh, include the Cook Brothers, the Republican political activists and billionaires. Uh, famous uh, Wild West era law enforcement dude Wyatt Earp. Current Secretary of State Mark, Mark Pom or Mike Pompeo. Uh, Oregon Senator Ron Wyden. Former longtime Pennsylvania Senator Ar Arlen Specter. NFL Hall of Fame running backs Barry Sanders and Gail Sayers and four-time Indianapolis 500 champion Rick Mears. And with that, let's go ahead and move on to our next destination. Okay, moving on, we're now in Manhattan, Kansas, home to 54,000 people. Uh, this may be the smallest non-Alaskan town we've covered on the series, potentially. Uh, maybe Lake Havasu City is smaller. Uh, but... Uh, Manhattan is notable for being home to Kansas State University, which is one of the largest universities in Kansas, so we're going to go fly over the town. The first American settlement in the area was in 1854. Uh, it actually has a uh, funny town history. Um, in 1855, abolitionists from New England, New England moved to the area and built a town named Boston. Uh, later that year, a steamboat called the Hartford... Uh, which ran on the Cincinnati Manhattan Company, ran aground near Junction City, which is a little bit upriver from here. Uh, so, just to get that straight, the town was called Boston, there's a steamboat called Hartford, and the steamboat ran for the Cincinnati Manhattan Company. Um, the, steam the steamboat ran aground, and the people on it were stranded, and they agreed to, uh, or, and the, uh, the residents of the town of Boston offered to let the uh, steamboat passengers uh, live in uh, Manhattan, or live in Boston. Uh, real quick, uh, this is Kansas State University. Very nice looking campus room above, I must say. Very nice, very nice. 
Yeah, as I was saying, so the residents of Boston offered to allow the uh, steamboat passengers to reside here, and the steamboat passengers accepted their offer on the condition that the town be renamed Manhattan, which I think is hilarious. Um, you have these stranded boat passengers, uh, and they're being offered shelter, but they won't take the shelter unless people rename their whole town. Uh, <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's, a, that's really funny. Um, and that's the story of how Manhattan became known as Manhattan. Today, Manhattan, is a, its nickname is the Little Apple, which is a play on New York City's nickname, the Big Apple. Um, nearby Fort, Li Fort Riley protected the town during the Bleeding Kansas period, and gold was discovered in the Rocky Mountains in 19 or in 1858, or 1859, sorry, uh, which brought travelers through the area. Um, Bluemont Central College was founded in 1858, and it was later renamed Kansas State Agricultural College and eventually Kansas State University. Um, it was the second uh, public institution to admit men and women as equals in the United States. Uh, so, uh, pretty good. They were ahead of the curve on that one. Uh, and a railroad connection was established in 1866. Today, the economy is uh, focused on education, military, and government. Notable people from Manhattan include longtime Packers wide receiver Jordy Nelson. Fun facts about Manhattan. In 2007, CNN and Money Magazine ranked Manhattan as one of the top 10 places to retire young. In 2011, Forbes ranked Manhattan as a number one place to start a career or business. Um, so, Manhattan, Manhattan Kansas, uh, if you're, if you're not from the uh, general area, you might not think about it too much, but apparently it's on the up and up. Um, kind of similar to Fayetteville, Arkansas, if you remember way back then when we flew over Fayetteville. I don't think I'd mind living in one of these like smaller college towns. Uh, I bet you it's a really cool atmosphere. Um, having a, a a big sports college sports team like this in a small town, um, I'm, I'm sure it's a really interesting dynamic. I went to a, a small D3 school for undergrad, and I'm going to uh, Georgia Tech for grad school, which is in Atlanta, so never really had that uh, small town sports feel um, because our D3 college uh, basically, essentially didn't have a sports team. We technically did, but nobody cared. Shout out to Rowan University <laughs> for giving me a degree. Uh, but with that, let's uh, let's go ahead and move on. All right, if you head east on Route 24 out of Manhattan, you'll eventually uh, stumble upon Topeka, Kansas. Topeka is, of course, the state capital. It is home to 125,000 people. 233,000 live in the metropolitan area. In the 1840s, travelers along the Oregon Trail would ferry across the Kansas River at present-day Topeka. Um, a railroad from a uh, Fort Leavenworth to Fort Riley was built in 1854, which brought more traffic to the area. Cabins were built in the area in the 1850s, and by the 1860s, uh, Topeka was a commercial hub and produced tomatoes, or potatoes, not tomatoes, potatoes, corn, and wheat, and they were able to ex export those crops via steamboat along the river. Uh, Topeka was chosen as a new capital of the state when uh, it was granted statehood in 1861. Uh, the Capitol building began construction in 1866, but wouldn't be finished until 1903. Um, they took their good old time on that one. Topeka grew rapidly through the 1880s, uh, which resulted in a real estate bubble forming. The uh, same real estate bubble that affected Wichita. Um, so the real estate bubble burst in the late 1880s and led to a recession afterwards. In the 20th century, Topeka was the home of the first African-American preschool west of the Mississippi. It was also the start of the Brown v. Board uh, court case, which uh, went all the way to the Supreme Court and resulted in desegregated schools. The tallest building in Topeka is the state capitol building that we're about to fly really close to. Uh, it stands at 326 feet tall. 
The largest employers in Topeka include government, education, and healthcare. The highest temperature ever recorded was 114 degrees. The average high is 66.1. Record low is negative 26. And the average low is 44.2. In 1966, an F5 tornado struck the city and did $100 million in damage. Uh, an F5 is, of course, the strongest uh, class of tornado. And I think it was, t it was either 2007 or 2011. I uh, neglected to write the date down. Uh, but sometime in that uh, late 2000, or the late um, zeros, early teens of, of the 21st century. Uh, Topeka renamed itself at Google um, as a joke, uh, trying to uh, convince Google to uh, bring fiber optic internet out to the town. Uh, and uh, on April Fool's Day of that year, uh, Google jokingly renamed itself Topeka. Notable people from Topeka include Fred Phelps, uh, who runs the Westboro Baptist Church. Go ahead and do one more pass over downtown, maybe check out some places east of the river, and then move on. You can definitely see a lot of a rail over yards right in downtown. It's super interesting to, uh, you can kind of tell, like, if you're flying over a city from above and you don't know when it was built, um, you can kind of tell based off of if there's a giant train yard right near downtown. Uh, because if there is a giant train yard, that means that, uh, the city wasn't settled till after the train era started, because otherwise that'd just be buildings that were built before trains became important. Um, so if you see a, a, a huge train yard in downtown like that, you can probably be safe in guessing that the town is west of the Mississippi somewhere. This is more of a question that, or more of a rhetorical question, I guess. Um, I know a interstate highway system and road construction throughout the 1950s has a history of redlining, uh, which uh, the construction of a highway segregated uh, segregated rich communities and poor communities, and, off and often it broke down along uh, racial lines. I wonder if, uh, I wonder if, uh, like uh, railroads ever had the same effect. Uh, back before highways became a thing. Um, especially down here um, in places like Topeka with a massive rail yard right in the middle of downtown. We'll fly over it one more time. Uh, like, you clearly see a separation between the downtown portion and then the rail yard, and then it goes right into residential. Um, so it, it's definitely a, a split in the city here. Um, and this is one of the consequences of a uh, transportation infrastructure. It really it has a potential to divide communities. Um, and it's a necessary evil sometimes because trains are important for freight and economy. Um, and highways are too. Um, but, you know, some thought should be put into it. And I think I remember uh, some of the impetus behind the Brown versus Board uh, case. Um, one of the reasons why the uh, pet, um, Mr. Brown sued in the first place was because uh, he, his daughter was near a school that he was that she wasn't allowed to go to, and instead she had to walk a mile or so across train tracks to get to the school she was supposed to go to. Um, and thinking about it, I wonder. I bet you it's this, uh, tra these train tracks right here. Uh, maybe not like right there, right there, but like maybe up the line a little bit. So you know. Uh, Without doing a lot of research into it at all, um, and going off of memory from my 7th grade social studies class, um, th this particular rail yard right here might be the reason why schools uh, became desegregated in the country. If you follow that butterfly effect logic. Uh, before I go off too much further down the deep end, let's go ahead and move out to a different city. 
All right, I did a little bit of research into Brown versus Board and determined that, in fact, Linda Brown, uh, the student in question, did have to walk across a dangerous railroad switchyard to get to her bus stop, uh, when that could have been avoided if she was allowed to go to an all-white elementary school closer to her, to her house. So, uh, in fact, that railroad switchyard we found may have played a role, or well, if it was that railroad switchyard we found, it could have played a role in the uh, desegregation of American schools. So that's a fun little piece of history that we kind of discovered together. Anyway, we're flying over Lawrence, Kansas. This is a uh, University of Kansas that we just flew over. Again, a very nice campus. And I'm going to ask you guys to uh, please fasten your seatbelts for this one because uh, this, the history of Lawrence is a bit of a doozy. Um, this is the most in-depth I've gone into researching a single town yet. Um, if that's the University of Kansas Stadium... Uh, I was going to say it's not, it's, the rendering isn't terrible, then I realized that the stands got made into office buildings, so never mind. I retract credit I was about to give. <laughs> um, but yeah, Lawrence has a uh, absolutely insane history, and I definitely have more information about Lawrence than any city we've covered in this entire series so far. So, let me stop stalling and get in, well actually, no, let me cover the other things first. Um, and then we'll go back and talk about the history. So this this looks like it's the University of Kansas Stadium, actually. Uh, which it's uh, not rendered very well, uh, seeing as it's flat. But at least it's not all office buildings. Today, uh, Lawrence economy relies on education, industry, and agriculture. Universities include University of Kansas, as we've been circling around. Notable people uh, that have lived at Lawrence at some point in their lives include environmentalist Aaron Brockovich, NBA all-star Wilt Chamberlain, Langston Hughes, actor Jason Sudeikis, and possibly the greatest athlete of all time, Jim Thorpe. Um, Lawrence was ranked as one of the best places to retire in the U.S., um, according to U.S. News in 2007, and was also ranked as one of America's best college towns in 2011. Alright, now let's talk about history. Lawrence was founded strictly for political reasons. Um, as an abolitionist town to counter counteract pro-slavery settlers from Missouri. Um, the city was first called New Boston, and then it was called Plymouth, in reference to both Boston and Plymouth Rock uh, in New England. Uh, the town grew for the following year, uh, which uh, angered the pro-slavery slavery settlers to the south and in Missouri, which is to the east. Uh, settlers from Missouri referred to the city as Yankee Town uh, in the pejorative sense. Uh, in October 1854, uh, the town was renamed Lawrence after an abolitionist New England businessman. Uh, the first homicide in Kansas happened on Election Day in 1854 when a pro-slavery slavery voter shot an abolitionist voter. Uh, in 1855, there was an election for state legislature. At the time, there were only 29, or, sorry, 2,900 eligible voters in the entire Kansas Territory. Uh, but on Election Day, 1,000 armed pro-slavery men from Missouri rode into t town, uh, carrying guns, knives, and even had pieces of artillery. Uh, and they rode into Lawrence and voted uh, to try to f flood the Kansas State Legislature with uh, pro-slavery members. Um, they were allowed to vote in Lawrence because they had 1,000 people with guns, uh, which was more than the population in Lawrence at the time. Uh, so Lawrence couldn't really do anything to stop them from voting. Uh... So, all in all, uh, despite there only being 2,900 eligible voters in Kansas, uh, over 6,000 votes were cast in the election, uh, and a very pro-slavery state legislature was enacted. Uh, Lawrence uh, petitioned to the governor to throw out the results of the election due to the clear election fraud, and the governor was uh, on board initially, but then he started getting personal threats from uh, pro-slavery men from Missouri, so he backed off and kind of had to let the decision stand. It was at that point when Lawrence uh, declared the state government to be bogus. Um, the, that's literally the term for it, the bogus government. Uh, and they started running their own little shadow government uh, from Lawrence. Um, guns, bullets, and artillery, including howitzers, uh, were imported into Lawrence at that time. Uh, they were sent over uh, with help from Horace Greeley. If you remember the Colorado episode, the town of Greeley was named after Horace Greeley, who was the, once the editor of the New York Times, 
and then a dude that moved out west. <laughs> um, and he helped send over a bunch of arms to Lawrence uh, to help defend the city. Uh, the shipments of arms were disguised as shipments of books, uh, quote, because the southerners had no need for reading things like books. <laughs> and the strategy worked, uh, none of the packages were disturbed by southerners um, as they were delivered. Alright, in November 1855, a pro-slavery settler named Franklin Coleman shot and killed an abolitionist settler named Charles Dow. The murder was likely a result of competing land claims, and it probably wasn't politically motivated, but it still turned into a, a big political thing. Uh, Sheriff, um, Sheriff Jones will call him, uh, he was pro-slavery, uh, so instead of arresting the uh, murderer, who was also pro-slavery, uh, he arrested Charles Dow. Charles Dowell's uh, friend, uh, who was on the scene, he, he was arrested for disturbing the peace. Uh, within hours, uh, Charles Dowell was broken out of jail by men, uh, abolitionist men from Lawrence. Uh, the pro-slavery uh, people saw this as an insurrection. Um, and... I lost my place. Sorry, yeah, so, yeah, pro-slavery men uh, saw us as an insurrection, and Sheriff Jones mustered a militia of 1,500 men from Missouri uh, to march on Lawrence. In response, Lawrence formed a militia of 800 people to defend the town. Uh, the citizens of Lawrence dug trenches and made other defenses. Uh, basically, they were ready for war. Uh, but ultimately, uh, this was uh, coming into winter time, and that winter was a particularly brutal one. Uh, so the extreme cold combined with the governor of Kansas uh, basically coming in and telling him to knock it off uh, prevented any actual fighting from happening. Um, in 1856, so the very next year, um, Sheriff Jones, the same sheriff from the last year of militia, um, attempted to ride into Lawrence to arrest the members of shadow government that Lawrence was running. Um, but before he could arrest anybody, a sniper um, shot, La or shot Sheriff Jones in the shoulder and drove him out of town. Uh, Sheriff Jones, predictably, <laughs> did not like that he was shot by a sniper. Um, and with the uh, support of a federal marshal, uh, gathered another posse. Uh, this time it was only 800 Southerners. Um, and a few weeks later, he rode into the city, arrested the 12 members of the shadow government. Uh, and looted and looted part of the city and stole over nine hundred thousand dollars in uh, goods. That's nine hundred thousand dollars in today's money. It was about thirty thousand dollars in eighteen fifty six money. Um, later that year, another mob of twenty seven hundred pro slavery Missourians uh, approached the city, uh, but the governor caught wind of it before they got here, and the governor sent federal troops to defend the city. Um, the, gov the Kansas state government granted Lawrence a town charter in 1858, but Lawrence still didn't acknowledge the Kansas, gov Kansas government, so they rejected the town charter. In 1861, Kansas finally admitted as a free state, so the abolitionists in Kansas won. Uh, but just months later, the Civil War began. Uh, so again, the uh, question of slavery versus uh, freeing African Americans was still at the forefront, um, especially here in Lawrence. Uh, Lawrence was a uh, Union stronghold, as you might imagine, because there's so many abolitionists in the area. Uh, and uh, there used to be raiders that would reside in Lawrence that would go over into Missouri and uh, cause a ruckus, uh, burn some farms down, steal some goods. Uh, and the Missouri um, people of Missouri believed that stolen goods from Missouri were being held in Lawrence. Um, in 1863, um, Lawrence was attacked by a group of uh, guerrilla soldiers from the Confederate, or Confederate guerrilla soldiers. Um, most of the city was burned down. Between 150 and 200 civilians were killed. And around $42 million in today's money um, worth of damage was done to the city. Um, nevertheless, the town was rebuilt. To this date, um, the Lawrence Massacre remains the either the third or the fourth largest uh, or deadliest attacks on American civilians in American history, um, behind only 9-11, the Tulsa race riots, and possibly the Oklahoma City bombings. 
Um, Oklahoma City bombings killed 168 people. Uh, these ones, or the Lawrence Massacre, killed between 150 and 200. Uh, so, it's hard to say for sure uh, where Lawrence slides in. Uh, Tulsa race riots uh, results in 800 civilian deaths. That was after this. So, at the time, uh, the Lawrence Massacre was the largest uh, civilian uh, attack in history, in American history. And of course, 9-11 was uh, much more than any of this. The first railroad connection was built to Lawrence in 1864, and then in 1866, the University of Kansas was founded. Um, so, certainly, uh, as far as the towns we've covered so far in our series, uh, this was the most wild uh, story. Um, I think the Wikipedia article for Lawrence, Kansas is longer than Wikipedia articles for all the other cities combined we've covered so far this episode. Um, seriously, the history, like, go, go check out, um, go check out the history of, like, Bloomington, Indiana, or Bil or either Bloomington, Illinois, either. Any Bloomington you want, and compare that to the history of Lawrence, uh, Kansas. Uh, you could fit 50 Bloomingtons worth of history, at least, into the history of Lawrence. Um, and that's one of the frustrating things about making this, these, uh, videos is that, uh, I use Wikipedia as my source, and Wikipedia is sometimes inconsistent with uh, the, light, the the amount of information they have uh, for certain places. And before you ask, uh, no, I'm not going to switch my sources, because Wikipedia is just um, way too convenient to use. And uh, it's, it's good enough for our purposes, I think. We'll fly over University of Kansas one more time. Uh, I'm sure we're all tired of uh, circling over Lawrence right now, but... I want to check out the college campus one more time. Again, a very nice campus. Um, has a bit of elevation change, uh, which uh, is unusual for Kansas. Uh, they found the one hill in Kansas to build on. Uh, but let's go ahead and move on to our final destination, Kansas City. Alright, so... Uh, Kansas City is the first uh, real city we've encountered. Oh, that's not true. Um... We've encountered a few cities that are right on the state borders uh, between two si um, between two states. Um, Texarkana, I remember, but also uh, just last episode, uh, Council Bluffs versus Omaha. Um, and I never really uh, had a consistent way of handling those. Um, like, should I include Kansas City in the Kansas episode or the uh, Missouri episode? You know, um, should I split it up and do the Kansas side and Kansas episode or do? and the Missouri side of the Missouri episode, or should I do it all in one? Um, and what I've decided, um, at least for Kansas City, since it's so large and it stretches into both sides um, pretty much uh, evenly, I mean, I, there's definitely more on Missouri, uh, but it's also the first and third largest cities in Kansas as well. Um, so I certainly couldn't leave it out of the Kansas episode. So what I'm going to do is... Uh, Record it now for the Kansas episode, and then re-air the exact same clip when we do Missouri. Um, that way, people from Kansas who want to see about see Kansas City get to see it. And same thing, people from Missouri, when they see the Missouri video, if they want to see Kansas City, they will also see it. So we'll cover the whole city uh, instead of just covering the Kansas side. Uh, so Kansas City is home to 495,000 people. Uh, that's Kansas City, Missouri. Overland Park is the largest city in Kansas. Or, the, sorry, the second largest city in Kansas. Um, and that has 195,000 people. Uh, the metropolitan area has 2.144 million residents. The confluence of the Kansas and Missouri River was an important economic and strategic spot for defense um, and also for trade. Uh, the city was founded in 1838 and quickly became the largest city west of St. Louis. Uh, during the bleeding Kansas era, fighting occurred in the Kansas City region, um, and the governor of Kansas and uh, Missouri both requested federal troops to be deployed to keep the peace. Um, Independence, Missouri, which is a suburb of Kansas City, uh, a little bit to the east of here, um, was a Civil War battlefield. The railroad reached Kansas City in 1865, and a railroad bridge across the Missouri River was built. With the completion of a rail bridge, rail traffic was funneled through Kansas City, and the population quadrupled in just 50 years. To this day, Kansas City still has the second busiest rail yards in the nation, behind Chicago. Kansas City 
Kansas began prohibition in 1881, but the Missouri side um, didn't have prohibition. Um, Missouri as a state rejected prohibition until it became a federal amendment in 1918. Um, so in that 40 year period, uh, people from, Can from, from the Kansas side would come over to the Missouri side to visit the taverns and engage in general debauchery. Once uh, prohibition was instituted nationally, it still wasn't really enforced in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, Kansas City, Missouri was run, the political scene was run by the Pendergast brothers, uh, who controlled the Democratic Party and therefore much of the local politics. Um, they were powerful yet corrupt, um, and they basically controlled Kansas City, Missouri from 1905 to 1939. Uh, when Tom Pendergast suffered from health problems and was convicted of tax fraud. I wonder what this super long building is here. That's cool. Kansas City was known as the Cross Worlds of a World in the 1950s. Independence, Missouri, which I mentioned already was a suburb. Uh, that was the home of Harry Truman, who was president after, um, in the late 1940s and early 1950s. And then Dwight Eisenhower closed out from the 1950s as president, and he was born in nearby, an Ab or he was not born, but he lived in nearby Albaline, Kansas. Uh, so, you know, uh, in that little time period, they had a nice little string of local presidents going on here. Inner city neighborhoods experienced urban decay in the 1960s, and urban renewal projects did little to bring population back. But they did end up tearing down historic buildings and replacing them with office buildings and parking lots. Um, there's some criticisms of the uh, urbanization patterns of American cities throughout the uh, 1960s, 50s, 60s, and onwards. Um, a lot of criticism relating to suburbanization and highways and uh, just paving everything. And I'll admit my bias here. Uh, I, I'm i generally uh, resistant to those criticisms. Uh, I'm, I'm generally pro-highway, um, even if that isn't the common opinion amongst uh, civil engineering academics these days. That's not necessarily a popular opinion. Um, but, you know, I, my gut, uh, I tend to fall on the pro-highway side, pro Oh, yeah, I'm, I tend to be sympathetic towards the development of cities in the post-war era. But uh, even I admit that uh, the urban renewal projects in Kansas City um, after the war were not great. You know, tearing down historic buildings and just building parking lots and office buildings isn't really, a, isn't really anybody's idea of a, a good move. Nowadays... Uh, the uh, main employers in the Kansas City metropolitan region include government, um, the IRS, and the Department of Agriculture both have heavy presences here, manufacturing, and agriculture. Kansas City is home to two sports teams, the Kansas City Chiefs, who are the defending Super Bowl champions at the time of my recording this, and the Kansas City Royals, um, who play baseball, and who also, uh, I believe they... Uh, they aren't defending, but they have won World Series recently. I, I'm not a, a huge baseball follower, so I'm not as up on it as uh, perhaps I should be. Let's see if we can find their stadiums. I know they're on the Missouri side. I know they're a little bit to the east of downtown. There's also a NASCAR track near Kansas City. I believe it's on the Kansas side near Overland Park. I could be wrong, though. I think I've spotted Arrowhead Stadium up here. No, never mind. We'll keep looking for it, though. We won't leave until we find it. Promise you that. It's like a Door of the Explorer episode. Do you see Arrowhead Stadium and whatever for Royal Stadium is called? Because I think they're right next to each other. I imagine they're by the highway, so let's follow the highway east. The Kansas City Park and Boulevard system is designated as an American Society of Civil Engineers Historic Landmark um, for being the first 
to integrate aesthetics of landscape architecture into the practicality of city planning, inspiring other cities to follow suit. Um, so, you know, um, we ding some points off of Kansas City for some of their urban renewal projects, but I'll give them props for that one. Notable people from Kansas City include Don Cheadle, Joan Crawford, Walt Disney, Amelia Earhart, Eminem, Irma Henningway, Tim Kaine, Claire Mc McCaskill, Janelle Monet, Rob Riggle, Paul Rudd, Darren Sproles, and Harry Truman. Before we get too lost, let me pull out my map and uh, actually find the, the stadiums. I'm a uh, Buffalo Bills fan, and uh, briefly last season, uh, I had tentative plans to come to Kansas City in the event that Buffalo Buffalo made it to the, um, that far in the playoffs and played against Kansas City. Um, but unfortunately, they lost against Houston before I even had the opportunity to go to Kansas City. So I had to put that on hold. So I think we're, fo we're following I-70 right now. Um, I type an Arrowhead Stadium into my maps. It is a long I-70. Right to the south of it. I think we may have passed it. But I'm not sure. At the very least, we're experiencing some of the suburbs. So that's not a total loss. See, the problem with planes is that they don't have GPSs, you know? So you have to, uh... <laughs> kind of have to find your own landmarks from the sky, and then on a different screen, or in my case on my phone, find a uh, spot on the map to compare it with. Uh, we are almost certainly f have flown too far at this point, so let's go ahead and loop back. Uh, and this is the last destination uh, we'll visit for a video, so I'll go ahead and do my outro. Uh, thank you all so much for watching. If you've enjoyed this video, I'm glad. Please don't crash the plane. <laughs> um, if you've enjoyed this video, I'm glad. I'm not going to ask you to like or subscribe. Although, I will mention that if you do subscribe, um, you can expect to see more of the same content. I'm not a variety channel. I, uh, upload Flight Sim and only Flight Sim. So if you want to join us for the remainder of the United States journey, then by all means, uh, We'd be happy to have you. Uh, so like I said, uh, likes and comments are fine and dandy, but what I really care about is... Uh, or Sorry, likes and subscriptions are fine and dandy, but I really care about the comments. Uh, I want you to comment for one of three reasons. One, uh, if I... If you feel like I misrepresented any facts about your state, um, either by omission or by being straight up wrong about something, or by just uh, being technically correct, but not really grasping the the right feel, the right vibe, uh, then by all means, please let me know. Um, I enjoy doing these because I get to learn about these places myself, uh, and I wouldn't want to mislead myself, and I certainly wanna, wouldn't want to mislead any of you. So I'd appreciate fact checking in the comments uh, if you uh, if you have any fa if you notice any facts that need checking. Um, two. Uh, if I missed any locations in your state, uh, please point them out to me so that I can go back eventually and do a Places We Missed video. Um, but three, last but not least, uh, if you um, if you know of any places in future states that I can take a look at, go ahead and let me know, because the only thing better than uh, telling me retroactively what places I've missed is going ahead and reminding or reminding me beforehand to go check out certain places in your state. I've already gotten recommendations for for Washington video, uh, so good on y'all for recommending uh, those places. Um, go ahead and uh, at literally any state that comes after this video in the alphabet, go ahead and let me know. And with all that said, I can't end the video yet because I still haven't found the sports stadiums. And I'm not going to keep dragging out this outro. So, 
let's just uh, sit in silence here for a second while we continue to fly around. Oh, there they are. Okay, so we were nowhere near I-70. Um, I wonder what highway that was. <laughs> uh, it looks like uh, we're potentially on Route 71. See, now I'm, now I'm even too busy looking at a map to even pay attention. I think we're on State Route 71 South. So if you live along State Route 71, uh, you just got lucky today because we flew over like the whole Route 71 corridor, basically. But yeah, here's Arrowhead, uh, and right next to it is where the Kansas City Royals play. I don't remember the name of their stadium. Both appear to be very well rendered. Um, I guess Arrowhead's a little bit better than baseball field, um, but both of them are pretty good. It's usually good practice to uh, have your sports stadiums right next to each other because they can share a parking lot. End up having to pave a little bit less that way. The only downside, really, um, is that you it, sometimes it's not really feasible to have two games at the same time um, because the traffic load would be too much. Uh, but with all that, uh, thank you all for watching. Uh, take care now, y'all.